Our sermon today is taken from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 21. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially in according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Thus says the Lord. Thank you. So, two things before I start. Sorry about the projectors. Um, they, they're going to just probably turn it off if it keeps doing that. And our la- hopefully by our last song, it'll be back on so we can sing. But if not, we'll worship without them. They'll be fine. Um, and number two, uh, I, I took too much. Uh, I bit too much that I can chew. Uh, the passage, I'm actually just doing ch- uh, verses 10 to verse 16. All right, on your, on your printouts. And what we just read out was verses 10 to 21. And that happened to be way too much uh, for me to cover in, in 30 minutes. So we're just doing 10 to 16. And then I'll cover the rest next week, um, uh, maybe to 21 or maybe to verse 3 of chapter 2. We'll see. All right, let me pray for us before we start our sermon. Father, we come to you now and we beg you that you would give us the eyes to see and the ears to hear because we know and realize and acknowledge the fact that unless your spirit causes us to fall in love with you, we would never do that on our own. Unless your spirit causes us to see, we'll never see the gospel in the entirety and, and fullness that it is. And unless your, your Holy Spirit causes our ears to hear, we'll hear this gospel message, but yet not be moved by it. So we beg you that you would come and that you would be with us at this time and by your mercy and grace cause us to see and hear so that we may understand and truly apply these things, uh, these hard realities uh, in our lives uh, today, that it may, may be more joyous and glorious than we could ever imagine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So friends, we're continuing in our series. Uh, we're going through First Peter, and we're still in chapter 1 of the series, and we've seen so far that Peter's intention of writing the letter, writing First Peter, is to encourage grieving Christians who are being persecuted financially, physically, okay, they're being exiled socially, economically, under the rule of the Roman Emperor Nero. And for two verse, uh, uh, for uh, the first 12 verses, all Peter does, which is interesting, all he does is remind these Christians of the eternal salvation that God has purchased for them in, in Christ, who died on the cross for their sins, and that's it. He doesn't actually tell them to do anything until we get to verse 13, which we'll get to today. And a commentator pointed out, Peter does not command these pained Christians to do anything until he has celebrated the wonders of God's salvation for them in Christ. What a reminder for us who tend to fix, fix, fix. Why does Peter do that? Because everything hinges on that. You know, every perspective, every command, every instruction he's going to give hinges on the fact that these Christians have an eternal salvation that's been secured for them by an all-powerful God through Christ who died for their sins on the cross. All of Peter's words of comfort, all of his encouragement have no foundational support unless the gospel actually happened. How so? How does God's sovereign work on the cross reinterprets our sufferings? Okay, three things I want to point out. 
Point one, your pain has a sovereign author. Your pain has a sovereign author. Point two, your faith has brighter clarity. Point three, your holiness has a unique drive. Your pain has a sovereign author. Your faith has brighter clarity. Your holiness has a unique drive. Let's go to point one. Your pain has a sovereign author. So in verses 10 to 12, okay, the first two verses of our passage, Peter wants to convince these pain Christians here that the pains and the great injustices on the cross was not accidental. It wasn't accidental. It was purposed by God from long ago. That's interesting. A particular suffering was purposed by God from long ago. You know, it wasn't plan B. It wasn't a detour. If he's able to prove this, it will have implications on how we view our own sufferings today, as we'll later see. So what does Peter do to prove that the cross, the sufferings of the cross was actually planned from long ago? Well, he goes back to the Old Testament. Okay, verse 10. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, Peter here claims that this salvation, right, the salvation that he's been talking about from verses 1 to, to, to 9, all about the cross, all about the pains of Christ on the cross. This has been prophesied by the prophets of the Old Testament. Now, if you read the Old Testament, if you know anything about the Old Testament, you'll be a little bit confused. How can Peter say the cross was ordained in the Old Testament when the name of Jesus was never even mentioned once in the Old Testament? Okay, when the concept of crucifixion, which is a Roman concept of, of, of punishing for crimes, that didn't even exist in the Old Testament. How can Peter say that the cross was ordained all the way from the Old Testament. And by the way, Jesus said the same thing, Luke 22, verse 44. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms in the Old Testament, everything written about me in the Old Testament, Jesus says, must be fulfilled. Apparently, Peter and Jesus both understand the Old Testament written through the prophets as ultimately pointing to Christ, to the cross. Okay? And if you read the Old Testament in this way, it changes everything. Pick a book. Pick a story. Moses, right? The one man who delivered God's people out of slavery to the promised land. What is that about? What situation was Moses born under? Right? An evil emperor who was trying to kill all the male babies because he was scared the Israelites were going to take over. What situation was Jesus born under? There was a male emperor at the time who was scared everybody was going to take over, so he killed all the male babies. Who is Moses pointing to? Who is the one that's going to deliver God's people from the slavery of sin to the promised land? Jesus. Joseph, thrown into a well, sold to sl slavery, ended up in Egypt, right? He won favor with Pharaoh, and he's placed in a position that can save many lives from famine. And he said to his brothers who threw him into the, into the well and sold him to slavery, he said this, As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive. What's that about? What evil was ultimately done that God used to bring many people to eternal life? The evil done to Jesus wasn't just that he was thrown into a well, but he was thrown into the depths of God's wrath. Okay, And he died. Why? So that many may live. David and Goliath. What's David and Goliath about? It's not about you slaying your giants like, you know, your singleness or, you know, your, your lack of career. And those are the giants of your life. And you're, if you have faith in God, you know, you can slay them and they'll go away and you'll get married. No. Who, are, who is the ultimate king of Israel? What was David before he was a king? He was a shepherd. Who's your shepherd king? You have a king who didn't only risk his life against a giant, so that you may be saved. You have a king who gave his life so that your ultimate giant, sin, is solved. What's the Old Testament about? You see, what does this tell us? It tells us the pain of the cross, the suffering of Christ, has always been the plan. This tells us that a meticulously sovereign, purposeful, all-powerful, eternally loving God has ordained it to be. Okay? Now, how about the pains of your life? Peter is asking these persecuted Christians. You see what he's trying to say? The same God who is transcendent over time, who has personally ordained the sufferings of Christ from long ago, is the same God who is transcendent above and is personally ordaining our pains now. 
That's what Peter's saying. It's the same blueprint. You know, but how is that, how is that encouraging? Well, let's take a look at that blueprint. Verse 11. Inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted, look at what was predicted, when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Do you see the b- blueprint here? What was predicted? Not only the sufferings were predicted and ordained, but the subsequent, the following, the connected glories was also a part of it. Here is God's blueprint when it comes to pain and suffering. Okay? Our sufferings are not accidental events that God must cancel out. They are not accidental events that God must cancel out. They are ordained events that he plans to redeem. What do I mean? What's the difference between canceling and redeeming? Okay, this is unique compared to any other world religion. You know, in every other world religion, the idea of relief from suffering is not redemption, but it's, it's, it's generally cancellation or deletion. What's the difference? Well, when you cancel or when you delete something, that thing no longer becomes a part of the equation. It's gone, right? Puff. Heaven or nirvana, you know, is in other world religions, generally speaking, a place where pain is no more because those things have been deleted from heaven, okay? It's gone like when you press the delete button on a computer. But that's not what the gospel says. The gospel doesn't delete pain. It redeems it. The picture of heaven isn't of God throwing white paint over the ugly colors that life has painted on a canvas. It's not. But it's God using those ugly colors to create something more beautiful than anyone ever expected could come out of it. Let me use an example. Maybe this will help you understand. When you came to Christ, okay, when you, you know, when you look about your own redemption stories, when, when, when you receive Christ, what gave you joy? Did your joy come because somehow God deleted all the bad memories of your past sins? Is that why the cross was sweet to you? Because when you accepted Christ, all those memories and experiences, all of a sudden they're gone and they're just deleted. No. You remember them, don't you? At least the big ones. Right? So why are you joyful now in Christ, even though the painful memories of of, of your past sins have not been covered in whiteout? Because those very things is exactly what makes the cross so sweet. You see, even me, even me with with that past, you could redeem? They weren't, they weren't erased from memory. They were redeemed. My vileness, my sins, they happened. They happened. God didn't delete them from my memory. He repainted how I see them. He gave me eyes to see how something so bleak is what led to me uh, receiving something as beautiful as the cross. And think about the cross itself. The cross was a terrible event, right? The Son of God crucified by sinners. And when we get to heaven, will that memory be deleted? Will the wounds of Christ be covered in white out? No. It'll be acknowledged in living color. It happened. It happened. Okay, how was Jesus described in Revelation? As a lamb, as if it was slain. It happened. But yet in heaven, when we see the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, when we're reminded of the pains that happened, the emotions that's going to rise from within us is not going to be pain of the past caused by the rugged cross but it's going to be an eternal praise and glory for what happened. See, the ordained pains of the cross has been redeemed, not deleted. He's still a lamb that was slain. Now, it took me a long time to decide whether or not to say this. And some of us perhaps never went through anything too painful or too dramatic to where saying something like this is not a big deal. But for some of us, it is a big deal to acknowledge it. And no one should rush you into it, okay? I want to be sensitive. No one should rush you into it. But at some point, if you want to really heal, at some point, you have to acknowledge the fact that it happened. Whatever it was for you, it happened. It happened. And depending on the degree of grief, it can be unbelievably hard to acknowledge that. Even Jesus' own disciples, they were hopeless after the cross happened. What did they do? They, they gave up. You know, Peter, who wrote this book, he went back to being a fisherman. He was just done. So, so when you're in grief and you have a hard time seeing the point, uh, when God's blueprint just that we talked about just seems to be the last thing in your mind, one, have grace on yourself. Be kind to yourself. It's hard. 
It's so hard. Even those who traveled, ate, and studied directly under Jesus, they couldn't see through the fog. No one expected this blueprint of redemption could happen from something as hopeless as the cross. But two, we'll never be able to have hope of redemption if we spend our whole lives trying to delete, trying to delete what happened. It happened. If we spend our lives trying to cancel it, we won't see, we won't hope for the redemption's, redemptive glory at the end. Peter here is encouraging these persecuted Christians, those things happened, and other things will happen. Don't be afraid. The blueprint pattern of suffering leading to subsequent glories, suffering leading to joy, that's the blueprint God has for all his people who've placed their faith in Christ. He will redeem it. Okay? Uh, uh, life may be painted with bleak colors now, and we don't know exactly how each color is going to work. But if the blueprint of the cross is true, if it's true, we know that God will use these bleak colors to paint a picture more beautiful than we could ever imagine. I don't know how. But you see, all this, Peter has no room to claim any of this unless the cross and the resurrection of Christ that was predicted from the Old Testament actually really did happen. It all hinges on whether or not the suffering to Christ leading to subsequent glories actually happened. If it didn't, Peter can't claim the blueprint to be true. And that's exactly what Peter's trying to do in verses 11 to 12. Point two, your faith has a brighter clarity. Okay, look again at verse 11. Look at how Peter describes the prophets, okay? They were inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glory. See, pay attention here. The Old Testament prophets, yes, they did write about the coming Messiah, as we saw earlier, but they were constantly inquiring what person, you know, what time, who's going to do it, when is it going to happen, how is it going to happen, meaning they didn't really know who or when or, or the clarity that never saw it happen, meaning the blueprint of the cross leading to the salvation of many, the suffering to glory blueprint, okay, that didn't really happen in their day. Look at verse 12. It was revealed to them that all these revelations about the Messiah, right, the prophecies that we read earlier, all these stories was not serving them. It was serving you. At some point, meaning they realize it probably was not going to happen in their time. All this foreshadowing, all these prophecies, they're meant to serve you and your faith. Okay, stick with me. Who is the you that Peter means here? Well, it's the persecuted Christians living in Nero's day. It's the persecuted Christians that lived after the cross. Okay? The you are those believers who lived after the cross. Let me get technical with you here. Stick with me for a second. Okay? What we see here is two eras in redemptive history. One era is pre-Christ, pre-the cross, the Old Testament prophets who were given some kind of revelation, some kind of foreshadowings about the cross. Remember all those prophecies and symbolisms we said earlier in the Old Testament, but they didn't really get to see the cross, okay? They were constantly inquiring to the predicted sufferings. They didn't really see it. That's the first era. The second era are those who lived after Christ, the you that Peter's referring to here, us, okay? Those who live after the cross event, after the Messiah came. By the way, quick side note, both God's people in the Old Testament and the New Testament, pre-cross event and post-cross event, both were saved by the cross, right? God was able to save his people in the Old Testament and forgive them for their sins because the payment will be made eventually. And God is able to save us today, right, and forgive us from our sins because the payment has already been made, but they're both still hinges on the cross. But here, what, what Peter is saying, that in these two eras, it's much easier to handle suffering, it's much easier to obey God in the midst of suffering, if you're one of God's people who lived after the cross. Why? He's serving you, not themselves, all these prophecies. Why? Take a second to think about it. How hard would it be to obey God in the midst of sufferings before you had the category of the cross, before you had a clear understanding of the blueprint of redemption, suffering to redemption that the cross shows? You know, imagine the prophets of the Old Testament telling God's people in the Old Testament, you know, don't bow down to false gods. And, and, and God's people say, okay, I won't, but if I don't, they'll kill me. And the prophets say, 
you know, don't worry about it. Don't worry about that. God's going to redeem all your sufferings. It'll happen, okay? And he won't cancel it. God, God would rather flip it over its own head, redeem it, and turn that suffering into something more beautiful for you than you can ever, ever imagine. And the prophets go, really? That's awesome. Okay, great. Where's the proof that he can do that? And the prophets say, the proof is coming. And they say, what? It's coming. What? You want me to stake my life on a suffering to glory blueprint that hasn't happened yet? And the prophets say, yeah. Imagine how hard that'll be. You know, why do investors require a good past financial performance record? Because you trust companies that have something to show for. Why do we, God's people who live today, have an advantage from the prophets of old? Because we live after the blueprint has been explicitly executed, after the cross event happened, after the predicted sufferings, the who and the when and the how, it happened. We have something in time and space, the cross, to say, look at this blueprint. This is how God works. Okay, I know, I know that's confusing, so let me use an analogy. Okay, imagine all mankind in all the eras, Old and New Testament, they're all blind in sin. Okay, we, we, we're all dead in sin, right? None of us, we've all gone our own way, the Bible says. And in front of our faces, all of our faces, there's a good news of God's redemption on a TV screen. However, none of us is able to see it and accept it and embrace it because God's redemption uh, promise because we're all blinded in our sin. Now, Old and New Testament, everybody have work. Okay, this is the case for all of us. Now, by mercy, the Holy Spirit comes and takes away this spiritual blindness and gives those whom he so pleases to give mercy to eyes that can truly see. He does this for God's people in the Old Testament, New Testament, and all ages. Okay? And now those whom the Holy Spirit has given eyes to truly see, they can see and embrace the good news of the gospel of grace that's shown on the TV in front of them. But, here's a kicker. For those who see God's redemption promise and lived before the cross event, the TV is more like a blurry, black and white, old CRT TV. You know one of those TVs that are like really heavy and 100 tons and, you know, they use antennas and it's unclear? Okay, they don't really see it. What? Okay, I know God's going to redeem me and I know by his mercy I'm saved, but I don't, really, I don't know the exact who and when and how. But for those who sees God's redemption plan and the Holy Spirit has opened our eyes to see the screen and to embrace it, the TV in front of them is showing God's redemptive plan on a flat screen, clear, multicolored HD TV using cable. Because now you see it. Now you know the suffering to subsequent glory blueprint. Those who live in this era post-crucifixion is of more advantage even the angels in heaven long to see it, it says our passage, right? In that sense, in the sense that the blueprint of redemption has happened already. We have seen God prove us and show us that suffering leads to glory. That pattern on the cross has been shown. And you know what this multicolor TV shows you? You know what the cross shows us? This. This is what it shows us. That everything sad is going to somehow be greater for having once been broken and lost compared to if it was never broken or lost in the first place. Everything sad is going to somehow be greater for having once been broken and lost, compared to if it was never broken or lost in the first place. That's what the cross tells us. Both God's people in the Old and New Testament don't know how all the gloomy colors will work together. They don't. But those who live post-cross event have a clear, clearer blueprint to hold on to. There was a uh, tragic sudden death this past Thursday, and I've asked uh, uh, I've asked people if this is a good idea for me to share. And, and somebody actually asked the the family that was involved, and and they said it's totally fine. They're actually glad that we share this. This is why I feel comfortable sharing it. But this past Thursday, um, uh, a death fell on somebody that many of us know. Uh, he's a band teacher at Espera Kamang. Uh, Mr. Benji, a lot of our members know him, a lot of our visitors know him. I spent, uh, my wife and I spent Friday uh, uh, at Espeja with, with some teachers and, and students talking about, um, talking about it. And he left behind, Mr. Benji left behind his wife, Miss Erna, and two young daughters. 
they're Christians. And, uh, and, and let me just share what Miss Erna, his wife, posted on Instagram Saturday morning, two days after her husband passed away. She said this, a sovereign God makes no mistakes. That's what she posted. A sovereign God makes no mistakes. While it might be difficult to understand, it does not change the reality that God desires our greatest good because he loves us and he is good. She posted that two days after the death. Where does that strength come from? How can she say that? From a sturdy understanding of the blueprint of the cross. Everything sad is going to somehow be greater for having once been broken and lost compared to if it was never broken or lost in the first place. That's the blueprint God shows you on the cross. Redemption, not cancellation. Now, Peter moves on to verse 13. And she fi- he finally, after proclaiming the blueprint of the cross for 12 verses, he finally, in verse 13, gives a command. What are we to do? Okay? As those who have eyes that have been opened by God's spirit to see the love of God through his son, that seen the cross, not only in blurry black and white screen, but in multicolored HGTV, we now who live post-Christ, what are we to do? Point three. Your holiness has a unique drive. Now, here it is, Peter's saying. It's coming. Here's the command. After 12 verses, here's the command. You know, prepare your minds for action, Peter says in verse 13. Literally translates to, pull up your man skirts. That sounds weird. I know. But that's what he says. Literally translates to this. Bind up the loins of your mind. Bind up the loins of your mind. Prepare your minds for action. You know, back then, they wore robes that would cover their loins, their, their hips. Right To bind their loins up means to pull up your robes and tuck them under your belt because you're going to get ready to run. You're going to get ready to do some work. Okay, And an equivalent saying today is, is roll up your sleeves. Okay, To do what? And you know, at this point, you think Peter's about to tell us to do something really hard. You know, after 12 verses of, of buildup, here's the command. You know, because you have the blueprint of the cross and you're, you're expecting something hard. And this is what he says. Because, because you have the blueprint of the cross... Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, Peter is saying, set your hope in the day where you will see how all these bleak colors will work into beautiful medley. You'll see. You'll see. Set your hope fully on that day. And we hear that and we're like, that's it? That's the command? The, after 12 verses of buildup, the command is just put my hope fully on this blueprint that's going to be revealed in the end days. That's, that's kind of an easy command to follow. That seems like anticlimactic. Are you sure that's easy? Are you sure that's an easy command? You know how hard it is for somebody in grief to hold on to that hope? Ask somebody who's currently in grief. It takes everything. It takes everything in them to hold on to that. It's not easy. Peter knows that. That's why he said it's going to take you binding up the loins of your mind to believe in this hope, especially if you're in grief. But if you are someone who sets your hope fully on that, you know know what you'll do? Pain and suffering will no longer be an enemy to avoid at all costs. You'll have hope. Bind your minds. You'll have hope. Okay, you're not going to avoid pain and suffering. You're going to have the courage to follow him even when it's costly. Remember, these are persecuted Christians. These were pained, exiled Christians. Based upon the power of this blueprint, Peter is saying, based upon the power of the cross, Peter says in verse 14 to 16, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of a former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Be set apart, even if that leads you to suffering. Don't avoid it. It happened, and it's going to happen. But God will redeem it. Okay, I'm going to touch more on verse 14 next week. I'm not going to be able to explain all of it here in today's sermon. But but for now, I want to simply say, holiness, you know, when it says be holy for I am holy, we can often misunderstand that because holiness has a kind of a negative connotation these days. Okay, it's used in many ways in a negative way, you know. When, when you say somebody's holier than thou, what do you mean? 
somebody's prideful, right? Or when you say, you know, oh, they're in a holy huddle. You've heard that before? A holy huddle? It's like when, you know, religious people are just kind of huddling in a holy huddle. And 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 you you use it in this negative context, right? And the, and the command to be holy can kind of feel self-righteous, right? It can kind of sound like Peter saying, just generally be more religious and less atheistic and more, you know, more uh, moral. If, if you do that, you know, and we can mis- misunderstand verse 14, if you can do that, then the suffering to glory blueprint of the cross can be yours. If you're more holy, you can then partake of the suffering to glory blueprint, right? If you're holy enough, if you're religious enough, if, you, if you're able to earn it with your morality, okay, then all your sufferings will then be redeemed. But that's not at all what Peter's saying. Look at verse 16. You shall be holy for I am holy. Okay, that's a quote from Levit- Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2. Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, this is Moses speaking, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. That's a quote from Leviticus 19, verse 2. But immediately, three verses later in verse 5, this is what Moses said. When you offer a sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord, you shall offer it so that you may be accepted. Three verses after Moses said, be holy for God is holy. Then he says, when you offer a sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord, you shall offer it so that you may be accepted. What does that mean? It means that your pursuit of holiness is not the prerequisite of your acceptance by God. Your pursuit of holiness, your your general personal ability to, to, to stay religious or holy or moral, that is not the prerequisite that you may be redeemed. Leviticus 19 verse 5 says, What is the prerequisite? That a sacrifice of peace is offered. Now, Leviticus 19 was talking about animal sacrifices for sin offerings, but we've gone through our first point today. We we went through verses 10 to 11 of our passage, and we know that all of the Old Testament points to Christ. So what do you think Leviticus 19.5 is talking about? Who is the sacrifice of peace offered to the Lord so that you may be accepted? Who willingly suffered on the cross? so that you may have peace with God. What are the animals about? What are the sacrificial lambs about? Who is the Lamb of God? Jesus Christ. See, every other religion says something to this effect. Be holy so that you can earn your way up uh, to God in heaven and you can forget all the pains of your life. You know, be holy, be set apart to get to heaven where all of your pains be forgotten and canceled out. That's not the gospel. What does the gospel say? The gospel says, be holy because God has come down to you and has guaranteed your redemption through his sufferings. So be encouraged. Be holy. Be set apart. Follow him. Even if it leads you to sufferings, it's okay because all of it will be redeemed. How do you know? Look at the cross. Look at that blueprint. He is not a God who waits for you and cancels your suffering. He's a God who pursues you and redeems your sufferings. So roll up your sleeves. Set your hope fully upon the blueprint of redemption that this God has shown you on the cross. And if following his word leads you to suffering, that's okay. No, he redeems. Be holy as he is holy. In all your conduct, verse 15 says, Roll up your sleeves. Go through it. None of your sufferings are accidental. None of them are wildfires. Everything broken will be made new. They may be confusing colors right now, but God will show you how he's going to recreate his masterpiece through those colors as he did for you on that cross. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and we thank you that you are a God who doesn't wait for us to get to you. And if we're able to do so, you cancel our sufferings and bring us to heaven. But rather, you're a God who brought heaven down to us. You're a God who entered into our sufferings and showed us how everything now is made new through suffering, subsequent glories that comes through the cross, which is the blueprint for all of our sufferings. And Father, now in this We come to you, and I pray that you give us the courage that we may see 
the blueprint that you've shown us over and over and over again, and that we may see your will for our lives, and that if it leads to suffering, we may hold fast in the fact that it would also lead to subsequent glories. Jesus, let me pray. Amen.